Chapter Ten of The Lady in Blue by Augusta Groner, translated by Grace Isabel Cobron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning Tony, Mueller instructed Ossip to be at the Grey House early next morning to search the garden for bits of the torn letter. Then, after a light supper, he turned his own steps toward the city theatre. He asked the secretary whether the latter had by any chance noticed two young women who were frequent visitors at the theatre during the month of May. They usually took front seats, and one of them was a strikingly handsome brunette, the sort of woman whom one does not easily overlook or forget. "'Oh, yes, indeed, I've noticed them,' answered the man without a moment's hesitation. "'Business has been pretty dull this month, and it's easy enough to remember the few people who come regularly, particularly if they are in any way conspicuous. Why are you so interested in these two young ladies?' he asked with a smile as he pulled forward a chair for Mueller. "'At my age, you mean?' replied the detective with a laugh. "'Yes, they do interest me in spite of my grey hairs, but I might as well confess that my interest is entirely official and not personal.' "'Official? That sounds queer. Who are you, if I may ask?' The secretary looked at the card in his hand. "'Joseph Mueller? Sorry, but that doesn't say much to me. Which speaks well for your honesty. I like to meet people who don't know anything about me and an everyday name like mine is a perfectly good alias whenever i want to use it as such but this may explain matters muller handed the secretary his official credentials the man looked at the paper carefully and handed it back with a more serious mien is it one or both of the two women that interest you i took them for actresses is it the handsome one the brunette no the other she was mighty good-looking too indeed so she charmed you as well as all the rest then there are others i am not surprised she was by far the more refined of the two the other was too showy too loud if i might call it that loud is good she's made noise enough in salzburg since her death death she's dead her name was elise lehman oh that was elise lehman too bad such a handsome creature but i want to know who her companion is wouldn't mind knowing that myself laughed the secretary but i don't see just how i can help you there you can help me to one thing to find out whether Miss Lehman's companion was in this theatre on the evening of May twenty-ninth. I doubt it. Still, oh, you needn't doubt it. I mean, I doubt whether she was here. Oh, I see. I thought you meant it was doubtful whether we can find it out. As it so happens, it will be an easy matter. That's good hearing. Go on, please. You see, we paper the house a lot these days. Our cashier has a son, a decent-looking young chap, who's fond of plays and who looks as if he might have bought an orchestra seat he goes pretty often see yes miller laughed well it so happens that this youth has noticed the two ladies he's not so interested in the show but what he can look about between the acts and he's young enough to be caught by a pretty face in fact he's asked me if i could seat him near the two i've rigged him considerable about the lady in blue as he calls her then you mean that he wait until we find out whether he was in the house that night Fifteen minutes later, Mueller knew that only the companion of the lady in blue was in the theatre on the evening of May twenty-ninth. The seat beside her, which had been bought and paid for that morning, remained vacant. The young woman looked pale and suffering and stayed only until the close of the first act. The links in the chain of evidence fitted perfectly. In the Café Bellevue, Mueller found Commissioner Senfeld deep in a game of cards. He sat down to wait, but Senfeld, now thoroughly aroused to a sense of his own omissions, and to a desire to make good on the layman case could not keep his mind on the game he made his excuses and left the table anything new he added in an undertone as he reached up for his hat yes antino replied muller come out where we can talk they strolled along the embankment until they came to an empty bench well queried senfeld a bit impatient i found out one thing said muller slowly this tony is only an accomplice an accessory after the fact Senfeld gave a deep sigh of relief. Also, I now know that the murder, or the killing, took place before seven o'clock on the evening of May twenty-ninth. But the two came home after the theatre at ten-thirty. Two people came home, but not the two women who went out together. The killer came home with Tony. I don't understand. I can't follow you. Very well, I'll picture it for you, in proper order, at least what I believe to have happened on that evening. Please do. Elise, Layman, and this Tony, who posed as her maid, left the house a little before six o'clock. Very shortly after that, Tony returned alone, opened the gate and house door with her own keys. She told the housekeeper that she had come for her lady's feather boa, but in reality she came back to open the side garden gate 
and side house door for the layman girl and a man whom the women met shortly after they left the house it was easy enough to do mrs diesler was in her own rooms and the gardener had gone off taking his dog with him i imagine this unknown man to have been a lover of the layman girl i found letters which are very evidently from a successful lover who signs himself goldie boy and from whom the dead woman parted forever as she believed on may fifth in Linz. this man does not seem to have been quite reconciled to the thought of losing her a letter carrier brought elise layman a letter a day or two before her death which she did not open immediately as she usually did she took it to a quieter spot in the garden read the letter wept bitterly over it and tore it into bits she thought herself alone but the incident was seen by buchner the gardener i intend to have the garden searched for those pieces to-morrow you think that letter was from goldie boy hideously sentimental title eh yes cheap sentiment throws a light on the mental caliber of the future baroness walroth doesn't it you think that letter was from goldie boy i imagine it i am sure only that some man came whom she wanted to receive with all secrecy for of course baron walroth must not know that he was there let us take for granted that it was goldie boy that makes all the sections fit with one exception and that is tony replied muller thoughtfully i cannot understand why this woman the sort of woman tony seems to be from all i hear should have aided and abetted the man and gone through with this elaborate apparatus of deception there are several possible hypotheses but we can go over those later you think the girl was an eyewitness of the deed muller shrugged his shoulders i'm not sure of that but i know she helped the man in every way but why should he return to the house and in miss layman's clothes he had to do this to clear tony of all suspicion and also to put off the discovery as long as possible which would help him in his own escape and tony had to arrange her alibi had to be able to call the diesler woman as witness that she could not have murdered her mistress as the facts stand the only possible time she could have committed the deed was in the morning between five and seven and the condition of the body when found proved that death had taken place many hours before the physician who came with you examined the body at seven thirty and besides the body was fully dressed miss layman had not been to bed at all that night she could not have been killed that morning and from the moment of her return after the last call from her mistress until five next morning tony was under mrs diesler's eyes couldn't it have been the moment she was upstairs you mean hardly likely she came down almost immediately and looked no different from before this tony seems to be a woman of strong and determined will but no human being has that much self-control you're sure the killing took place during the early evening absolutely the housekeeper heard the girl's death cry at seven o'clock or shortly before what she heard a cry then why the deuce didn't she tell me because our mysterious friend tony who thought of everything told the old woman that she would only make herself ridiculous if she bothered the police with such old wives tales oh you believe me now senfeld nodded when his victim was dead continued muller the murderer removed her hat cloak and gloves or rather muller halted a minute and then went on i should not say murderer i find no signs of premeditation but every evidence that the man acted in a fit of uncontrollable rage and then went through a moment of horror amounting to insanity after the deed the girl must have goaded or taunted him he paused looking off into distance as if trying to reconstruct some scene yes said senfeld softly not to disturb his companion's thoughts i can imagine it now myself a cold-hearted beautiful woman has a thousand ways of striking a man to the heart if he is foolish enough to love her and this woman utilized men's passions to draw from them the money she needed for her extravagances senfeld looked up with a new interest was she that kind i wondered she was not the woman whom baron walroth should have married but he too was dazzled by her beauty he has had a fortunate escape then the other man is excusable yes his rage may have been excusable the fact that he took a weapon which he found in the room and not something he had brought with him speaks for an utter lack of premeditation a revolver would have been different yes yes that's quite logical said senfeld but do you think miss layman did not take off her outer garments herself muller shook his head no she did not do it herself she was killed while still wearing her cloak i have proofs of that and one glove at least was drawn hastily from her hand drawn so roughly that it was badly torn although quite new it was probably done after the homecoming when the body had begun to stiffen i have not found the other glove yet 
but he must have pulled that one off as well. Gloves on a suicide do not look very plausible. He snatched off the hat, throwing one of the pins up against the wall under a little table. I can imagine how it burned his hand. The other pin probably fell out of the hat itself, and he laid it on the mantelpiece later. When he left the house the first time, he took one of the dead girl's blue silk gowns. She had made things easy for him by her fancy for that color, her cloak and hat. He even, I believe, went so far in his care for the comedy to be played later that he took a pair of shoes. Her shoes? But could a man wear them? Elise Lehman seems to have been a tall, well-built woman. Yes, she was. I remember I noticed her height when they lifted the body. She had a large foot, but this man, although he may have been able to wear her shoes for a short time, strained them across the ball of the foot and walked heavily enough in them to bear the heels well down into a chance puddle. How did you? Remember the shoes I showed you in her bedroom, the muddy shoes? Sandfeld's murmur was almost a groan. He was immersed in the depths of a humiliating realization of his lack of qualifications for his official position. They did not expect to meet anyone on their homeward journey, Mueller continued, when his companion did not answer. But they had to be ready for emergencies. Women's skirts are some few inches up from the floor now, and the man's own shoes might have looked inappropriate under a light silk gown. They went to work carefully, those two, and I am inclined to think the idea of the masquerade was Tony's. It sounds more like a woman. But this is merely a surmise. I have no proof of that yet, only that there was a masquerade. I must find out whether anyone was seen carrying a bundle in the neighborhood of the Grey House that evening. Or he may have taken a bag from the girl's closet, a valise, or something like that. I can easily ascertain if that is true. Then they didn't, either of them, the women, go to the theater that evening? Oh, yes, Tony did. The girl is astoundingly intelligent. She realized that something might have happened at the theater, some incident that would make talk next day, and it might have looked queer if neither of the women knew of this. Of course, up to that point, Tony did not know what had happened. She merely wanted to cover the other girl's tracks, to make it appear they had both been there. But she must have been uneasy, for she looked ill and left after the first act. Then she must have met the man somewhere. I can't just yet see how or why, but she must have met him and learned what had happened. Then the comedy of the homecoming was arranged. Maybe she expected to meet Miss Lehman again, so that no one would know the latter had been with her lover. Yes, yes, that is an idea. That may have been it. But the man came alone, and, yes, in that case, the idea of the clothes was his. Queer, anyway, they came home. He took off the clothes, but there had been a shower and the blue silk skirt was spattered and muddied in spots. The shoes were muddy. He stuffed them in the closet and left the cloak out to be cleaned and mended. Couldn't it have been mended some other time? I mean, before that evening? I doubt it. The dagger had pierced the cloak and the killer would hardly want to have the body found in hat and cloak. Or else, you can imagine he would have dreaded to touch her. That was human and natural. The cloak had to be mended and cleansed, so that the truth would not be known, at least as long as the guilty parties were within reach of the authorities. But the truth did come out, remarked Senfeld with a blush, although I had very little to do with it. You thought it suicide, as did the others, said Mueller soothingly. What must we do now? We must find this Goldie boy, and most of all we must find Tony. I have hunted all sorts of criminals in all sorts of places, but I confess this woman intrigues me more than most of them have done. Back of these actual facts, which must have been more or less as I have pictured them, there is some story, some relationship between these three which will explain much once we know it, and which, if we only knew it now, would help us measurably in finding the people we must seek. The girl seemed very refined for a servant, said Senfeld, seeking about in his memory, but she was simply dressed and humble in demeanor. The secretary of the theater, who did not know anything about the women except their appearance, said he imagined them to be actresses. We know Miss Lehman had been on the stage, and in the variety houses, too. But why should a fellow professional masquerade as her maid if Tony was an actress? Of course, if she was, that would show why she played her part so well. Maybe she was in league with the layman girl to help her see her former lover? Yes, the fact that she helped in the secret meeting would speak for that. But what came later refutes the theory. And besides, Commissioner, I have discovered in the course of many years of work that the actions of a man or woman must be read in the light of the character rather than of mere surface facts. When we have no direct evidence to tell us whether a certain person has or has not 
done a certain thing, we must fall back on what we know or can learn about this person's character and habit of life. That is the only safe guide. And that is why I regret more than I can say that I did not see and speak to this Tony myself. But from all I hear, from all sorts of people, tell me yourself, Commissioner, do you think her the sort of woman who would help another in a low intrigue to betray the trust of the man who was to have given Elise Lehman wealth and assured position for the rest of her life? Senfeld hesitated, then spoke slowly and humbly. I'm afraid my observations are of little value. I remember only that the girl was very pretty in a quiet, refined, dignified sort of way, and very modest and gentle, although intelligent and definite in her answers. More I could not say without trying to cover my own stupidity. Still, that is of value what you have just said. Now why should such a woman go to such lengths of danger for herself? Later, why should she stay on here, and why should she play into this man's hands as she did? Love is, of course, the usual explanation for a woman's sacrifices for a man, but if Tony loved this man, would she have arranged his meeting with a woman who had been his mistress, and then help him escape? A woman will do much for love. Still, she doesn't usually help the man she loves to a tete-a-tete -tete with another woman whom he loves. No, not usually. There are other combinations. I must think them out. This Tony is going to give me a sleepless night or two, that I know but I'll try and trace Goldie Boy. And, by the way, there will be no need to exhume the body. I know now that Elise Lehman did not come home with Tony that evening. But if you can do so, I wish you would find the driver of the cab that brought them home. The man may have seen or suspected something. I would like to know where they picked him up. Mueller rose, and Senfeld followed suit. Oh, yes, I forgot, said the commissioner as they turned toward the center of the town again. There's been a letter from Hubert Lohr, Elise Lehman's stepbrother. He had wired that he was coming soon, but he writes now to say that, as the burial is over, he will not be here after all. He makes no claim to whatever she may have left. He is a poor man, a teacher of music, and finds it impossible to take the time from his work. He doesn't mention the expense, but I fancy that's the chief objection. He says that he may come later in the summer on his vacation and visit her grave. Not what you'd call a loving brother, is he? remarked Mueller. No, but he was only her stepbrother, and at least he's not mercenary. But I don't suppose she had much to leave. Nothing, perhaps, but just what is in the grey house. Her clothes, and the bit of money, which really belongs to Baron Walroth, hardly enough to pay for what such a journey would cost a poor man. True. Good night, said Mueller, giving the commissioner his hand. Then he turned and walked off quickly. As the detective passed through the lobby of the hotel on his way to his room, after having stopped for a word with the attendant at the door, a young man rose from one of the big chairs as if to speak to him. But when Mueller halted, expectant, the young man blushed, stammered something about a mistake, and sat down again, raising his paper so that his embarrassed face could not be seen. Mueller smiled, bowed slightly, and passed on. He had seen a strongly built, blond young man, with nothing to mark him from hundreds of other well-clad youths. Still, Mueller, who never neglected anything, stopped at the desk and asked, in an undertone, Who's that man? He's registered as George Branchley from Vienna, replied the clerk, and he was asking for you this evening. Asking for me? Well, I don't know. He asked if a Mr. Mueller from Vienna was stopping here. He must have wanted some other Mueller. That's why he was so embarrassed when he discovered his mistake. Good night. End of chapter 10